Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our second session for our Peace Weekend, where we've, um, we're covering um, the theme, Enduring to the End. Now, I'm just going to open with a word of prayer. I'm going to say a few words about peace, um, 2010 through to 2021, where we are right now, um, how life is continuing, what we're doing. Then we've got a special guest that's just going to share a word of encouragement to you all. And then um, where we will be hearing from our speaker for the day, um, Pastor Daniel Pell. So I'm just going to say a word of prayer. If you could join with me, that would be fantastic. Dear Lord, I thank you for the privilege that we have to be here in 2021. Uh, though we're not together physically, we are able to come together in spirit and over um, technology. We are praying that the technology today, that it, it, everything goes well, that there'll be no problems. And uh, we're just praying that everybody who's watching will continue to be enabled, empowered, and equipped as we continue with this work. We thank you, Lord, for all that you are doing and that you continue to do in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, as you're aware, the theme for this weekend is endure to the end. <clears throat> Peace has been running since 2010. We're here in 2021 and we will be running an online program. And what's happening today, um, yesterday we had our speaker, Elder uh, Jan Harry Kabunko. He, he gave a powerful message. Today we've got another powerful message coming from Pastor Daniel Pell. Later on this afternoon, though, we're not doing a live stream, but from 5 p.m. till about 9, we are having the time where we'll be hearing some stories from the different pe people from different peace groups from 2010 through to 2019. Um, so we're looking forward to that time. So if you want to join us, um, do keep an eye out for the Zoom link, which will be shared in the Facebook comments and the YouTube comments. I'll be sharing those shortly. Um, and it will be great for you to join in with us later on, starting at 5 p.m. on Zoom. Tomorrow, we'll be running our training session, which will be run by a number of Peace graduates and also uh, people who will be helping us with the program. Uh, do keep an eye out for the sessions. We do start tomorrow at 11 a.m. We're looking forward to the training. We'll be training people on how to use TikTok, how to use YouTube, how to do live streaming, how to do a podcast um, and different and other, other sessions as well, how to do blogging and create content for social media. Um, but I do want to uh, just introduce you to the president of the North England Conference. We have with us today... Pastor Jackson, just trying to, here we go. Pastor Jackson, if you'd like to just join us. Um, I'm here, Craig. Hey, Pastor Jackson, good to see you. Good to see you too. So for those that are watching, Pastor Jackson's currently serving as the North England Conference President. He's taught at peace as well. Um, excellent supporter of peace. He serves as the chair of the peace board. And I'm guessing Pastor Jackson, you're the chair of many other things as well. Yes. Um, there's several hats that you have to wear. And for those of you that are watching, just to let you know as well, um, he's got, he, he has some excellent produce from his allotments. I don't know if you'll be giving them away or selling them, Pastor, but I know that um, some of those things that you gave us at peace served us in the cooking department. So we're grateful to have you with us and just want to hand over to you now just to share a few words with those that are watching. Thank you very much, Elder Gooden. Let me say a pleasant good morning, oh, good afternoon. It's after 12, good afternoon to everyone at peace. I just want to say to God be the glory for all of you. Um, I want to say that Peace has been around since 2010 and still continues to do a tremendous work here in the North England Conference of Seventh-day Adventist. And, and I want to, to join with Ella Gooden by supporting this venture, supporting the, the, the Peace School, supporting what Peace does, because after all, Evangelism is our mantra. Evangelism is the lifeblood of the church. If we don't evangelize, nothing is going to happen. And I'm grateful to God when we can, you as young people can come together 
and learn and commit your lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. And, uh, and once we are committed to him, you are given the, the opportunity at peace to demonstrate and to show that commitment that you have through the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is to tell somebody, tell someone about the goodness of Jesus. And may I say to, to all of you that I want to thank God for all of you on behalf of the North England Conference, Pastor Hush, Elder Ram Haraksin, the executive committee, the directors, I want to say thank God for you. And I trust and pray that in your own space, in your own place where you are, that you're making a significant contribution. We don't want you to just come to peace and then go back and relax in your churches. Uh, I know most of you are not doing that, but just in case the enemy tell you that I've learned so much and I won't do anything with it, just tell the enemy, get thee behind me, Satan. I am here at peace. I've gone to peace. And, and the main reason I came to peace is that I want to tell somebody about the goodness of Jesus. So I want to, again, thank God for, the, for, for, for Ella Gooden and his team in a very special way. I know the team is small from time to time, but at the, at the same time, you have taken whatever you have and you have done a tremendous work in, in, in terms of ensuring that the peace school and the ministry of peace continue to impact the North England Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. So again, may God bless you, Ella Gooden, and your family as you channel the waters, even in this uh, torrid time that we are experiencing. Peace will still be running. We are moving it online. We don't know when we will come back face to face, but whatever happens, our commitment is to keep peace alive as we train young people to serve into the community that is out there. May God bless you all and may he keep you and may you enjoy your wonderful weekend that the Lord has in store for you. God bless. Thanks again. Thank you very much, Pastor Jackson. Um, we pray as well that you have a blessed Sabbath a great thank weekend you. at the same time as well thank you for those words of encouragement to all of those that are watching and i do want to say thank you for the continued support that we do have from the north england conference to continue running peace even though it's all going online we're still very grateful we've got to make the most of the situation so thank you again god bless and greetings to the family from us as well i will thank you god thank bless you very much thank you thank you okay everyone so i want to introduce you all to Pastor Daniel Pell. Now, you know, I remember it was a, an alumni where the whole the whole of Birmingham was frozen over, and uh, Pastor Daniel Pell came over to speak at that time, um, and a lot of the alumni just weren't able to come. I remember those that did come. I think it was on the this yeah on the Sabbath, uh, we had people that were you know covered in their um, in sheets. People you had their coats on. It was freezing cold because the heating wasn't working properly in the building as well. But we did come together and we did, we, we had a blessed time. Daniel Pell, when you came at that time, people were blessed by the messages that you shared. Um, we're encouraged to have you with us again. Just uh, by way of introduction, Pastor Daniel Pell is a passionate communicator of the Bible, dynamic. He loves presenting the message in a dynamic and very logical way. Um, and he's been an inspiration, not just to us at Peace, but to many others around the world as an international speaker. We know that he has a, a very high enthusiasm for ministry. He's currently serving as a pastor and evangelist and Bible teacher in the country of Norway. And Daniel lives with his uh, wife, beautiful family, Sylvia, and their two sons, <clears throat> and they love spending time. Um, he loves spending his time with his family in God's creation in nature and, and the beautiful scenery that you do have there in Norway. So Pastor Daniel Pell, I'm just gonna hand over to you. Um, grateful that you're able to be with us today. So let me just 
do this. There we go. And I'll hand over to you now. All right, thank you so much, Craig. It's wonderful to be together with you all here this morning or this afternoon. Uh, we're actually an hour ahead of you even here in Norway. Uh, but thank you so much for the opportunity to, to speak at the Peace Alumni Weekend. Um, as Craig um, mentioned there, I was actually uh, at, uh, in Bir Birmingham for three years ago now. And uh, I remember very well that flight because there was a lot of snowfall. And uh, the pilot even said when we were on our way to land in Birmingham, he said, I'm not sure if we can land. <laughs> so we, uh, but we did end up landing. And uh, some of you were, were there for that weekend. It was, a, it was a great time we had there. But uh, good that we can, despite of um, this pandemic period, that we can just gather uh, through Zoom. Uh, and I know that people are watching on Facebook and YouTube. So welcome to you as well. Uh, our theme that has been chosen is Endure to the End. And I love it. I love the theme. I've been thinking about it, praying about it this week. And I believe the Lord has been giving me some thoughts uh, that uh, I look forward to share with uh, each one of you. Uh, before we do that, let's have a word of prayer that the Holy Spirit will guide us and lead us in our time together. Heavenly Father, we come before you with thankful hearts, thankful for the opportunity to connect, thank you, thankful for the opportunity to open your word. And we ask that the same spirit that inspired the word may inspire and guide us. Grant us an understanding of what it means to live in these very times, Lord. Help us to see uh, your purpose and plan for each and every one of us. And I pray that you will tailor make this message for each and every person. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, we're going to begin our time together uh, in the book of John. And so I invite you to turn to the fourth gospel book, the, boss, the, the gospel book of John. And uh, what we're going to do this, uh, this afternoon is... Um, we're going to have a look at what it means to endure to the end. And uh, in order to approach this subject, I want to take you on a little journey through scripture. And first, we're going to look at how Jesus endured till the end in his ministry, in his public ministry. And then we're going to look at how we can endure to the end in our ministry living uh, in these days and these times. And so our study is going to begin uh, with the life of Jesus. And so you can turn to the book of John, and we're going to look at a number of passages uh, in the book of John. And um, we're going to pick up quickly. You're going to see that, there, uh, that these texts are connected uh, as we're going to look at the final hour uh, of Jesus's ministry. We're going to lead it up to the final hour. And uh, this is also going to be um, a theme that we're going to look at as we consider our own calling today and the final hour that we are living in, um, in 2021. So uh, John chapter 2 and uh, chapter, uh, uh, chapter 2 uh, is dealing with the first miracle of Jesus. Uh, Jesus performed this miracle when he was at a wedding. Uh, several of you, or most of you, I believe here, we are speaking to Peace alumni, so most of you will be familiar with this story. Um, fascinating uh, story about how Jesus uh, turns uh, the water into grape juice, into wine, and, and he is, um, this is the beginning uh, of, his, uh, of his public ministry. I want you to take notice of uh, a text here in chapter 2, and I'm going to read it from verse 2. It says, now, both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. So here we are at the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. Uh, uh, a problem uh, has risen. Uh, there is no longer any wine. I think there's a lot of sim symbolic meaning going on here. Uh, as, as Jesus performs this first miracle, he is actually showing us uh, that he is the new wine. Uh, wine in the Bible is a symbol of uh, teaching. Uh, true doctrine uh, is the pure wine, the pure grape juice. The um, 
false teaching is the fermented wine or the alcoholic wine. You see this clearly throughout the Bible and, and, and especially in prophecy uh, as you move into the book of Revelation. So it's fascinating here that uh, just like they have run out of wine at the wedding, uh, Judaism has kind of run dry. Uh, it's just a form of, of rituals and, and, and uh, the religious leaders are not, no longer providing the freshness of God's word. And here Jesus comes into the picture and he is the one that performs this miracle at the beginning, at the outset of his public ministry. And he is showing that he is the one that provides the refreshment of the word, the refreshment of the spirit. It comes through his teaching. It comes through his wine, the pure grape juice. And, uh, but what I wanna especially focus on right with you right uh, here, right now, is this expression uh, of Jesus when he speaks to his mother. He says, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Now, Mary, the mother of Jesus, was present at the wedding. And uh, of course, she's been following along uh, the story of her son for already 30 years. Uh, she is reminded about the miraculous birth of Jesus. She's reminded about the visit of the angel, Gabriel. And she knows that Jesus has come into the world to do something very special. And she believes that now is the time for him to reveal himself. Now, um, Jesus responds, and in our English Bible, it sounds almost like, a, you know, like a rude response, like, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? If you look at it in the original text or in the original language uh, in Greek, uh, it's not actually, it's, it's not that he's being disrespectful, but he is at the same time not allowing himself to be pushed um, he knows when the time is right. He knows when the time has come. Now, uh, we know that he did perform the miracle, but the hour, his final hour had not yet come. The hour for the signs to begin had come, but the final hour of his ministry had not yet come. As a matter of fact, if you drop down to verse 11, the Bible says, this beginning of signs Jesus did in, in uh, Ghana, of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. And uh, actually when you go through the story of John, through the gospel of John, uh, you'll notice that uh, John is actually counting these signs, these miracles that Jesus performs. So the hour had come for the signs to begin, but the final hour of um, him taking upon himself the sins of the world and, and dying as the Lamb of God had not yet come. And so we uh, push the fast forward button here and we follow the ministry of Jesus. And I want you to turn in your Bibles from John chapter two to John chapter seven. Go to John chapter seven. We're here looking at the hour uh, in the ministry of Jesus. Uh, and then we're going to look at our final hour, but we're here tracing first the ministry of Jesus and how he relates to his time and, and when it had come. And very fascinating, in John chapter 7, um, some people are again pushing uh, uh, Jesus to reveal himself, just like his own mother at the wedding wanted him to reveal himself. And take notice of the text here in John 7, beginning in verse 2. And the Bible says, now the, the uh, now the Jews' uh, feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brothers therefore said to him, depart from here and go into Judea that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For even his brothers did not believe in him. Verse six. Then Jesus said to them, my time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. Interesting, now it's his brothers that are trying to push him into revealing himself. And they say, just, you know, you know just, just reveal yourself to the world. And Jesus says, my time has not yet come. Well, the time for miracles had already started. The time for teaching about the kingdom of God had already started. The time for casting out demons had already started. But there was, some, there was still an hour, there was still a time that had not yet come. And this is very significant when we look at this whole subject of enduring to the end. 
because Jesus is fixated, he's focused on a future moment, on that final hour where he is going to take upon himself the sins of the world and pay the price for our sins and lay down his life as the Lamb of God. But that time has not yet come. That time has not yet come. And so Jesus doesn't allow himself to get pushed uh, too early. Uh, and, and it's interesting because I'm sure that Jesus was very aware of the Old Testament and very aware of the prophecies in the Old Testament. And among others in the Old Testament, we have actually a prophecy, a very significant prophecy that pointed forward to when Jesus would come on the scene, when his public ministry would commence or begin, and also when his public ministry would end with his death on the cross. And that is Daniel chapter nine. And uh, Jesus is aware of Daniel chapter nine. He was perfectly on time when he was baptized. The Messiah uh, rose out of the water and the spirit came down upon him. He began his public ministry, it was a marked moment. But Jesus was also very aware of what the prophecy in Daniel 9 said about him being cut off in the middle of the prophetic week. And uh, I, I, I know that I'm, I'm speaking here to alumni students that you'll be familiar with this prophecy. And for others that are joining us today and watching this, uh, you can go and study that prophecy in Daniel chapter 9. It's a fascinating study of a prediction about when Jesus would start his ministry, when the Messiah would come, Messiah means the anointed one, when Jesus would be anointed with the spirit to commence his ministry, but also when he would be cut off, when he would die on the cross. And Jesus is aware of this. Jesus is aware that his time in John chapter seven has not yet come. All right, we push the fast forward button again and we move on in the book of John. And you can turn with me to John chapter 13. John and the 13th chapter. And now we are coming to the moment where the hour has come. The time is now, has now arrived. And uh, I want you to take notice of what is happening here. It's, it's fascinating. Uh, John chapter 13, uh, just to give you a little bit of background before we read, uh, now the, uh, the Passover feast is, uh, is, has, has again, uh, is again taking place in Jerusalem. Jesus has just rode into Jerusalem on that donkey. Um, he has been hailed as a king, the son of David. He has come into the city, and now he is together with his 12 disciples in the upper room, and he is celebrating the, 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 the Passover uh, feast with his disciples. They have been on a long journey, and um, they're all gathered there together. And take notice what the Bible says in John chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. It says, now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew, take notice of this, he knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them till the end. Now, Jesus is aware of this moment. He knows what is about to happen. It's fascinating because they are, they are celebrating the Passover and the Passover was pointing forward to what Jesus was now going to go through. Remember that the Passover was introduced when the Hebrews were in Egypt, in slavery, in bondage. And, and, and God said to them very clearly, you can read it there in, in, in the Exodus chapter 12, that they were to take a lamb on the, the 10th day of the first Jewish month. And then they were to slay the lamb on the 14th day. And they were to put the blood on the doorposts of their homes. And remember that when the 10th plague took place and the angel of destruction moved through the land of Egypt, he would pass over the homes where the blood was on the doorpost. So the Passover was a celebration of how they were set free from the bondage of slavery, from the bondage of Egypt, through the death of the lamb that protected them from the set from the 10th plague. Now, this is just incredible because now Jesus is the lamb and he's come to the point where he is going to give his life. He's going to spill his blood as our lamb so that we can be set free from the slavery of sin. And Jesus is aware that the entire history of Judaism, the entire history of the Hebrew nation has pointed to this specific time, to this specific hour. Now, we're not talking here about an hour as to be a literal 60 minute time period. We're looking here at the final moment of his ministry. That is the final hour. And the book of John leads us up 
to that final hour. When he started his ministry three and a half years ago at the wedding, he was at that wedding, the time had not yet come. When he was at the Feast of Tabernacles, his brothers were telling him, reveal yourself to the world. His time had not yet come. But now when he's with his disciples in the upper room, preparing for, the, for these final scenes, he knows that time has come. And I don't think we in our uh, language can express the full importance and significance of this moment. I mean, this is the most important time, the most important moment in the entire history of humanity, in the entire history, period. I mean, here, God himself is going to lay down his life in human flesh, in, uh, through uh, Jesus, the body of Jesus is going to lay down his life so that sin, the wages of sin can be paid for, so that we can be forgiven and cleansed, and that we can have a hope for an eternal life. This is the moment. This is the hour. Now, as all of this is taking place, because uh, this is happening in the upper room, and uh, Jesus knows that the next moment after this meal, he has had this meal with his disciples, he's going to move into the Garden of Gethsemane. Already in the Garden of Gethsemane, the sins of the world are being placed upon his shoulders. Shortly after that, he's going to be taken captive, and then he's going to eventually end up being nailed on that cross. But here in the upper room, as he is now facing his final hour, he's facing this final moment, what else is actually taking place? Well, um, we're not going to read it now just for time's sake, but I, I can refer to it and you can go back and read it later. But in Luke chapter 22, which is kind of the parallel story of Luke to what is happening here in John chapter 13, Luke describes that as they are gathered in the upper room, the disciples, the 12 disciples, they are discussing something. And what they are discussing is who is the greatest among us? Now, just, just, just let that sink in for a moment. Jesus is facing his final hour. Jesus is facing the moment where he needs more human support than he could ever have uh, needed in this, at this very moment. At the same time, his disciples, they are on a different planet. They are somewhere completely different. They are not aware of the final hour. They are not aware of what Jesus is about to go through. They are discussing who is the greatest among us. I mean, after being three and a half years together with Jesus, they are still bickering and fighting among themselves as to who is the most significant. Well, um, it was a little bit of a problem because someone needed to wash the feet. I mean, it was very common after you journeyed on, uh, you know, on, a, on, on those dusty roads uh, in, there in the first century, um, uh, Israel, you, you needed someone. So there was always someone to wash the feet. Usually, yeah, of course, it was the job of a, ser a servant to do that. Um, who was going to do it as they had gathered now in this upper room? So this was also, you know, going through their minds, like they're looking, I can just imagine they're looking at each other like, you should do it. No, 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 you should do it. Like, like who's going to do it? Now, you know, it's often like this, that when we face something important in life, like let's say you're, 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 you're uh, the next day you're going to have an exam or, you know, you have something important that you need to accomplish at your job. I don't know how it is with you, but, but I think I think most of us can relate to this. When we have something important in front of us, when, when this kind of final hour has come and we need to perform, whether it's an exam or something at our job, we need to be able to mentally prepare for that. We need to be able to not have anything around us bother us with other things that will take our attention away from that, that, that significant moment that we're facing. Now think about Jesus for a moment here. He's facing the most difficult task anyone could ever face. The sins of the entire world are about to be placed upon his shoulders. He's going to go through the agonizing physical uh, and mental um, suffering. And at that very moment, there's something else he has to relate to. And that is his own disciples that are fighting among themselves. And if there's any time in scripture, a picture of the incredible patience and love of God, I believe it's right here in this text. Because despite of what the disciples are going through, Jesus takes a moment and he reveals to them 
what it means to endure till the end, to love till the end. Let, let's read the text again. This is, this is, so, this is so beautiful. Uh, John chapter 13, verse 1. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. He loved his disciples so much that he was now going to reveal to them in the midst of this moment what true service is all about. We continue to read in verse two, it says, and supper being, uh, supper being ended, the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son to betray him, Jesus knowing that the father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself and after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with, whom, with which he was girded. What an incredible picture of the gospel. What an incredible picture of the love of God that in this hour, at this time, when Jesus is faced by such a significant, huge task that words even can't explain, He's willing to meet the needs of his disciples. His disciples, he loved them. It says he loved them till the end. You could think like, how, how would you deal with that situation? Like I, I know for myself, and we, we can be honest, you know, uh, you know, I have two small kids, young kids. My, my oldest is six. My, my, my second son is four. You know, when, I'm, when I have a significant task, I'm like, please leave me alone. Don't bother me. I have something important to do right now. Jesus faces the most important task, and yet he takes time for his disciples. He loved them till the end. I mean, it's easy to love in the beginning, right? You have a new friend. Oh, they're just great. It's easy to love in the beginning when you just get married. It's the honeymoon, right? Oh, I just love you. It's easy to love when you, when you just come to a new church. Oh, everyone's so friendly. And oh, the potluck is great. And, and the fellowship is incredible. Loving in the beginning is one thing. But how about loving till the end? How about enduring till the end? Now, I mean, what would, what, what a witness if the church could start loving one another till the end? I mean, what about relationships and marriages if we started loving till the end? I mean, what about, what, what, what about uh, friendships? If we would just not love in, in, in good days, but also let love in difficult days? I mean, if we would start expressing this type of love that we read about here in John chapter 13, the world would be transformed. I mean, this is the witness that the world needs right now, that we love not only in the beginning, not just in good days, but we love till the end. Amen? I mean, it, and this is not even the end of the story because, you know, Jesus, shortly after this, he, he goes with his disciples to the, um, to the Garden of Gethsemane. The sins are now being placed upon him. He asks three of his disciples to pray with him while they fall asleep. He still loves them till the end. Uh, then, uh, you know, the, the, the mob comes into the garden and, and, and he's taken captive. He's taken away from them. And, 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 and then... In the next hours that follow, Jesus is taken from one place to another place. He, he's eventually taken before a pilot. Pilate washes his hands and, 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 and delivers Jesus to the Jewish leaders. And, and he's taken to the hill of Calvary and, and he is crucified. And, 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 and as he's suffering on the cross, he loved his disciples still till the very end. I mean, when he's looking at his mother, remember, he took care of his mother and made sure that she was taken care of by one of his disciples. As, as the thief on his side is, is, is seeking for, for, for comfort and help, he, he's there to give the assurance that he will be with him one day in paradise. I mean, he loves us till the end. And then, you know, Jesus is laid in the grave and all hope seems lost. And, and uh, the disciples, they're again gathered in the upper room in Jerusalem, and, 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 and they don't know what to do now. Um, and uh, if we uh, go to John chapter 20, we read about how Jesus visits them after his resurrection. 
And this just also shows how, how Jesus is patient with them and he loves them even till the end, even though they, it takes so long time for them to understand who he really is and, and what his ministry is all about. Take notice how they have quarantined themselves uh, in Jerusalem. They've locked the door of that upper room where they're gathered in Jerusalem. They're quarantined by their own fear, anxiety, and they are uncertain about the future. And then the Bible says here in John chapter 20, look at this, verse 19, it says, then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst. And he said to them, peace. Here's the peace alumni, peace. Those were the first word, that's the first word that Jesus said to his disciples when he appeared to them. Peace be with you. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Now, this is not the end of the story because they've locked themselves up, quarantined by fear and uncertainty of the future. Now you would think, you would think that when Jesus has appeared to them, and when Jesus has encouraged them, that they will certainly unlock that door and actually now start proclaiming him and preaching about him, right? Well, not quite. Because if you drop down a couple of verses here in John chapter 20 and uh, take a look at verse 26, it says, and after eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them and Jesus came, the doors being shut and he stood in their midst and said, he says the very same thing, the very same words that he said eight days before, peace to you. Now take notice, they've quarantined themselves. And then the next week, they're still, they've still locked themselves up and, and, and they're still uncertain and they're still full of fear. They're still full of anxiety. They have no idea about the future. And Jesus again appears to them. You see, this is, this is you, you would think by now that they would be ready to go out and preach, but no, not yet. And Jesus is patient. He is enduring with them till the end. He is loving them till the end. Now, eventually, they unlock that door. Eventually, they go out of that room. But guess what they start doing? I mean, take a look at this. Drop down in chapter 20. Uh, 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 go, go to the end of chapter 20. And we'll go now into chapter 21. And look at the first verses of chapter 21, verse 3. It says, Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. Really? I mean, are you serious? Like, that's what you were doing three and a half years ago. That's what you were doing when Jesus came to you the first time. When Jesus came to you, you were fishing. You were catching fish, like, from your boat. Jesus said, follow me. You received the call to be a disciple. You've been with him three and a half years. You've heard his preaching at the Sermon on the Mount. You've seen the miracles performed. You've seen demons leave people. You've seen the dead being raised up. You've seen Jesus set himself now uh, risen from the grave. He's appeared to you. He has given you a call. He has breathed his spirit on you, and you have quarantined yourself, and now when eventually you open the door, the only thing, you, the only thing you can think of doing is going back to fish? Well, Jesus still loved them till the end. He still endured with them till the end. And by the way, don't think that you are so different because we can find ourselves in the very same situation. Like, we just want to go back and do what we're comfortable with. Like, okay, I'm not so sure about this Messiah thing anymore. Yeah, at one time I was really on fire. At one time, I went to peace. At one time, I actually door knocked. At one time, I actually used my time and talents and resources to reach out to other people. But, you know, I don't know right now. I mean, you know, I just need to kind of, you know, get my life together. And, and I just need to do something that I actually know I can do. So let's just play it safe. And let's just go back to do what I at least know I can do. Let's just go, well, for Peter, fishing. And you fill in the blank. Maybe some of you feel like, like that right now. You're actually using your time and talents on things that you were doing previously when you know that God actually has a more significant call on your life. Well, I just love how Jesus deals with this because he loved them till the end. He endured with them till the end. Look, take notice what happens. As Peter goes out fishing, you can read the story in John chapter 21. They catch absolutely nothing. Zero fish. 
like they, they, they go out during the night and I'm, I'm, I've been told, I'm not a fisher myself, but I've been told that that's the best time to fish, but they catch absolutely nothing the whole night. Well, in the morning, they see someone there on the, on the, on the, on, on the shore. It's Jesus. He's been there all night, by the way, following that boat. Uh, you know, Jesus is the creator, right? He created all the fish. So, you know, I can just imagine the scene, like the boat is moving over there and Jesus is like, okay, fish, come over here, come over here. They're like moving to the other side and they're like, oh, where's the fish? This makes no sense. And so they're kind of, you know, paddling to the other side of the lake and Jesus is like, okay, fish, come over here, come over here. And he's just leading the fish away from the boat. And they're like, they're, they're frustrating. Like, this, like, have we lost the skill? Like, this is what we always did. We were fishes. We made our livelihood this way. Can't we do this anymore? And, and Jesus, you know, is doing this with a purpose. He is allowing them to fail because he wants them to succeed in something else. Perhaps, perhaps God will at time allow you to fail in something that you think will give you the security that you desire for this life because he has something better for you and a security that is rooted and grounded in heaven, amen? And so uh, eventually, you know, they see Jesus there on the shore and, um, <laughs> you know, Peter, I, I don't know the logic about this. You can tell me what you think. He puts on his jacket and jumps into the water. I don't know why, but he swims to the, he swims to the shore and, uh, and then the others come and then they meet with Jesus and Jesus prepares a breakfast for them. And, and they're sitting down there and they're talking together. And, you know, there are certain moments that you read in scripture. And I just think to myself, I wish I was there. I wish I could sit in and listen to that conversation. And this is one of those moments. I, I wish I could just sit there and just listen to Jesus talk with the disciples. The conversation is not recorded, but, but, but you know, I just guess that Jesus was renewing their call to discipleship. Jesus was saying, you know, perhaps something like this. Remember when I called you three and a half years ago? Remember when I said to follow me and you, and you dropped your nets and you followed me? Remember what you've seen? Remember what you've experienced? See how the scriptures point to me. See how I am the Messiah. And I've risen now from the grave. And I have a calling upon your life. I have a significant task for you to fulfill. You are to be filled with the spirit. I'm going to send you into all the world. And you are going to preach this gospel. Jesus endured with his disciples till the end. I mean, he loved them till the end. And he asks, you know, Peter, do you love me? He asks him three times, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And Peter says, yes. And then Jesus says, well, then feed my sheep. Like, like go out and preach this message to the world. Jesus wanted his love that he had for his disciples till the end to now be a kind of love that his disciples would have for other people to the end. You see, we are called to love to the end, to endure to the end. Let's, let's go in our Bibles to this actual text that has been chosen for, for, this, for this weekend uh, as a theme. Go to Matthew chapter 24, and I wanna show you something powerful here in this text. John, uh, Matthew, sorry, chapter 24. Matthew in the 24th chapter. And verse 13, look at what it says. It says, Jesus speaking here, he says, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. He who endures to the end shall be saved. Could we, could we just replace for a moment the word endure to the word love? Look at what it says. But he who loves to the end shall be saved. What did Jesus do there when the final hour had come there in John chapter 13, when he's gathered there in the upper room and, and it says in the scripture in John 13, verse one, it says the hour has come. The same verse says, and he loved them till the end. He loved them till the end. You see, in order to love to the end, we need to endure. We need to endure. We need to endure with the inconsistencies of people. I mean, that's what ministry is all about. We need, to, we need to endure with opposition. We need to endure with being spoken badly about. We need to endure with gossip. We need to endure with impatience. I mean, this is part of the calling that God has given us. As a matter of fact, it's so fascinating because the verse prior to this theme verse that we're looking at here in Matthew chapter 24, 24 and verse 13, look at the verse prior to this. 
This is in the, in the end time setting. This is in a setting of Jesus about to return. And how is the world described in verse 12? It says, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. The love of many will disappear. So in our day and age, we see it all around us. We see it in society. We see it sadly in our church. Sadly, it is seen in many homes. The love is disappearing. The love is waxing cold. And in the light of this comes the call, he who endures till the end, he who loves till the end shall be saved. And look at the verse that comes after our theme verse, verse 14. I mean, it's just sandwiched between these two very important verses. If we want to endure till the end, we have to love till the end. And the love is waxing cold in the world around us. But in verse 14, it says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world and to all nations and then the end will come. What kind of gospel needs to be preached? A gospel that loves till the end, a gospel that endures till the end. And this kind of gospel, my friends, cannot only be related in words. This is not just the gospel that we can preach. And that's why it says here that the gospel must go as a witness. What is the witness? The witness is the endurance of love. The witness is love that doesn't give up, love that endures till the end. I mean, till the end, not just in the beginning, but to the very end. And, you know, there will come days and moments in our life and in our ministry where, where our love will be tested severely. There will come moments where you, you won't feel like loving that person. You won't feel like showing patience in that particular situation. I mean, people can really get under your skin. I mean, look at, but look at what Jesus had to go through with his disciples. And we will face that. We'll face it in church settings. We'll face it in our own families. We'll face it when we deal with people. But in order for us to reveal the gospel to the world, we need the type of love that Jesus demonstrated, the type of love that endures to the end. And by the way, that's not a love that we have in, in us. It's not a love that, that, that is just, you know, can be unleashed by some kind of self-help. This is a love that must come from outside of us. It is something that we need to receive from above. There's no other place where that can come from. Now, I wanna, I wanna show you, I wanna just lead you to a couple other texts here. Um, as we, um, as we move towards the close here. But, you know, maybe some of you have heard about, uh, before we go to this text, um, maybe some of you have heard about the uh, concept of delayed gratification. Delayed gratification is a concept that was studied uh, more significantly in the 60s and 70s at Stanford University. And it was connected with a test. And uh, maybe some of you have heard about this test or seen this. Uh, it's called the marshmallow test. Now, gr delayed gratification, the principle of that is that um, uh, it's, it's actually what they do is they test children to see if they are able to rather put off an immediate gratification for a larger gratification at a later point. So what they do, and you, you can actually, you can, you can Google this on YouTube. I think there's several videos of this. Um, they'll put a marshmallow in front of a four-year-old. I have a four-year-old, so I know exactly how this works. You put a marshmallow in front of a four-year-old and the experimenter will say to that four-year-old, I'm gonna go out of the room now for a moment, for a few minutes, and you can decide, either you eat that one marshmallow, marshmallow that's on the table, or you wait, and when I get back in a few minutes, you will get two marshmallows. Okay, so this four-year-old is like, what am I gonna do? And they film them, it's hilarious. You can watch it on YouTube. And so there's these kids and some of them, they're like, before the guy is out of the room, the marshmallow is in the mouth, right? <laughs> they're already eating the marshmallow. And, and others, you can just see them there and they're like, they're just looking at that marshmallow. They're just looking and the minute goes by and they're just looking and, and they're like, some of them start smelling the marshmallow. Some of them like pick it up and, and then they quickly put it back down because they realize like, I need to wait because I want two marshmallows, right? And some of them start like kind of like, so one of them actually starts licking it but then puts it back. It's, like, it's hilarious to watch. 
And some of them are actually able to just not touch that marshmallow. I mean, they have the kind of self, um, you know, strength, the strength to, to, to not eat that marshmallow. And then uh, the experimenter comes back and then they receive two. Now what they've done, they haven't just studied these kids when they were four, but what they did is they followed these children. And then they looked at how they were performing in their teenage years and in their early adult years. And this is what they found out. Those who practiced delayed gratification as four-year-olds, they displayed a striking array of advantages over their peers during their teenage and early adulthood. As a matter of fact, they scored higher in social competence, in self-assuredness, and in self-worth. They were able to plan better and they were able to, uh, to resist unwanted behavior. They were better at reasoning through problems. Now, it, you might think like, why do you bring up this test? Because the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is about delayed gratification, right? Like, like look at this whole story of, 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 of Hebrews chapter 11 and, and the account of all these men that lived by faith. You know, Abel sacrificed the lamb because he's looking forward to the Messiah. Abraham packed his stuff and he moved to the country that God wanted to show him. He never ended up, you know, um, in, inheriting the land. He lived in a tent all his life, but, but there's something he's looking forward to. Uh, what about all the prophets that looked forward to the coming of the Messiah? What about the, uh, the disciples that went out and looked forward to the second coming of Jesus? Things didn't happen in their lifetime. And yet they were able to put their faith in an ultimate reward that was in front of them, that was in the future. And this is what we need to do as well. I mean, we need to put our faith in the reward that God has promised. And it's much better than two marshmallows, amen. <laughs> I mean, we're talking here about the new world that God is gonna create in the end, where all pain and suffering is gonna be removed, where there is no coronavirus, where there is no depression, anxiety, fear, sin will be ultimately removed. That is the world that we're looking forward to. And we put our faith in that, though we do not experience it yet right in, right in the here and now. Delayed gratification is needed in ministry if we're going to love to the end. I mean, am I going to still invest in that per person when I see no results? Am I still going to try to reach out to that person when, when, you know, it didn't go as I wanted it to? Am I going to still be kind and friendly and loving to those church members that seem to ignore me? I mean, I need to continually keep before me that picture that Jesus has given me of loving to the end enduring to the end, delayed gratification. One day the reward will come, my friends, but we need to put our faith in Jesus and endure till the end. Don't grab that marshmallow in front of you right now. You know, don't go the route of, of being short and turning away and just moving on and thinking like this person is not worth my time. Don't go the route of just loving in the beginning, but not in the end of a relationship. Don't go that route of, of, of taking that, you know, the cheap path, the, the, the low path that doesn't lead us to experience the ultimate love of God that he wants to fill us with. Let's rather wait. Let's rather endure. Let's rather persevere till the end. Amen. You know what I find so fascinating? I was just thinking about this the other day. You know, the most urgent message in the Bible is Revelation 14, right? A present truth. Like for our day and age, Revelation 14, the three angels' messages from verse 6 to 14. This is the most important message for our time. You know, and there we read about the, the gospel going into all the world, and we read about the hour of judgment has come, and we read about worshiping the creator, and we read about the uh, Babylon has fallen, and, and the mark of the beast um, issue, and we need to make a choice to be on God's side and not on the side of the mark. And, and when we read about these three angels' messages, the most, the most important messages for our time, guess how these messages end in verse 12? It says, here is the, can anyone fill it? Can anyone finish it? Here is the patience of the saints. And I'm like, what? 
patience? Like, this is the most urgent message. Like, let's just get out and preach this message. And this is the most urgent message ever. Uh, ever. And the most urgent message in scripture says, here is the patience. Why? Because in order for us to preach that message to the world, in order for us to live out the three angels' messages, we need patience. We need to endure till the end. We need to love till the end. We will need patience more than anything in order to fulfill the commission of preaching this message. You know, I, I'm 40 years old. I was born in 1980. I started ministry in um, 2003. I got married. I was 23 years old. Years old. I got married with my wife, Sylvia, and we formed a, 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 um, a team, a mission team. And since then, for the last 17 years, uh, I've been preaching. I've been traveling around the world, been preaching evangelistic series. Uh, I've been pastoring churches, teaching at Bible schools. You know, when I look back at those 17 years of, of, of ministry, if I would have to say, what are some of the most important lesson uh, that I've learned? That would be to be patient. <laughs> I mean, to endure when things don't go the way I want them to. I mean, you know, if you've ever done an evangelistic series, you'll know exactly what I mean. Expectations are there, but they're not always met. If you've ever done any Bible studies, you will know exactly what I mean. You feel like, oh, am I getting anywhere with this person? You know, and the list goes on. We need patience. We need endurance. I mean, this is a marathon that we're in. You know, it's not a sprint. There are many that have thought that the Christian life is like a sprint and they're already out of the race. They're already doing something else. They're sprinting now for the world. They're making money in the world. They're making their career in the world. If you are going to be in ministry, think about this as a long-term commitment a commitment where you are patiently working with God. And if Jesus comes in my lifetime, oh, I will rejoice. But if he doesn't, I'll endure till the end. I mean, is that the kind of commitment you've made? Or will you be disappointed if Jesus doesn't come back in five years? Will you leave it all together because he was supposed to come and I guess he didn't, so I'll just go on and do something else. We need endurance. We need patience. Oh, I think that was an inspired word. There in Revelation chapter 14, as, as John is penning down the three angels' messages, I believe the Holy Spirit inspired him with the, word, with the word patience. Here is the patience of the saints. Here is the patience of the saints. You know, David, the son of the, 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 the great king in the Old Testament, he wanted to build the temple. And then God just said to him, no, your, your son is going to do it. Your son is going to build the temple, Solomon. But then God added, but um, it's a good thing that it's in your heart to do this. You know, I don't know what's going to happen in my lifetime. Maybe Jesus will come. I believe he will come. I believe he's coming very, very soon. But even if he doesn't come, the truth will be in my heart till the end, till the last day, till the last day that I breathe my final breath. I pray and hope that I will endure that race that is set before me, that I will endure the race till the end. Let this truth be in our hearts, my friends, so that we can endure till the end. I want to share with you one last uh, text. I see that our time is running out, but if you could just permit me to use a couple more of your minutes uh, here on this Sabbath afternoon, just turn to James chapter 5. Let's look at this. Uh, another text on patience and endurance, um, especially when we think about our final hour. We've been looking at Jesus' final hour, but you know we have come to our final hour. We've come to the we've we've come to the final hour of Earth's history, I believe, as we as we look at prophecy fulfilling around us. What is our focus to be in this final hour? Look at James chapter five, and uh, I'm going to read from verse seven to eight. Verse seven and eight. Look at look at look at what it says. Therefore, be patient, brethren. Be patient, brethren until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and the latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. And take notice how James, the brother of Jesus, as he records these words for us, he says in verse seven, be patient. 
Then he says, wait. Then he says, be patient again. Then he says again, wait. He's repeating these words in the context, the immediate context of the latter reign and the second coming of Jesus. Could it be that when these, pen, when the, when these words were penned 2,000 years ago, that God was looking through the corridors of time and he saw a generation of peace alumni in 2021 and he knew that someone needed to hear, someone needed to be patient but as they were waiting upon the second coming of Jesus. Could, there be, could it be that, that God saw that there would be a generation that would be living through a pandemic in the year 2020 and 2021 and they needed to hear these words, be patient. Jesus is soon coming, but we are called to be patient, to endure till the end, to love till the end. You see, when it talks here about the early rain and the latter rain, and this will be my last, my last point here, it's connected with the hour of Jesus. Now, now, just follow me in this thinking. I hope you're not tired in your mind yet. I hope you can just follow the logic of what I'm about to say here. Jesus's final hour, okay, his final hour, his, that, that time in Gethsemane and his death on the cross was directly connected with the early reign because, look at this, in the history of the uh, uh, Old Testament, you had the Passover, the lamb that was slain on the 14th day of the first Jewish month, which led them out of Egypt. And then 50 days later, you had what was called the Feast of Weeks when they received the Ten Commandments at Sinai. It was 50 days later, and that was also a feast that they held. So the hour of the lamb being slain was connected with the 50 day later event, 50 days later event of the receiving of the law at Mount Sinai, the Feast of Weeks. Now, what repeats itself in the New Testament is that Jesus comes to his final hour. He's the Lamb of God. He is slain for the sins of the world. He dies on the cross. 50 days later, Pentecost, Penta, 50, 50 days later, what happens? Well, in history, God's people were gathered around a mountain and fire came down and they received the law. Now, God's people are gathered in the upper room. Fire comes down from heaven and they are filled with the Holy Spirit. The early rain is, is a symbol, the early rain is a picture of the falling of God's spirit on Pentecost. That's the early rain experience. The receiving of the spirit was connected with the final hour of Jesus as our lamb. Now, fast forward the story. Here we are 2000 years later, living in the year 2021. And Jesus is not our lamb anymore. He is our high priest. Jesus is our high priest in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Now listen, the final hour of Jesus's ministry in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary is connected with the latter rain. Now the latter rain is the Holy Spirit that will be poured out again upon a generation living prior to the second coming of Christ. Every farmer will tell you this. I mean, th th they know this. What is needed for that grain to sprout, the early rain? You know, you sow the seed, but in order for it to sprout and to start growing, it needs water, it needs rain, the early rain. But in order for that, as it grows up and it's about to ripen, what does it need to finally ripen and get ready for the harvest? The latter rain, the latter rain. So, so what's, what are we waiting for? What are we enduring towards? What is our final hour? Our final hour, my friends, is the receiving of the latter rain. The final hour for us before Jesus returns is receiving the outpouring of God's spirit. Like in the days of Pentecost, we're gonna see it on a worldwide scale, but only those, only those who endure till the end will receive the spirit. Only those who love till the end will receive the latter rain. And I pray, that every single person today on this Zoom call or watching on Facebook, watching through YouTube, I pray that you will be among that number, that you will be among that generation that will be enduring till the end, loving till the end, preparing yourself for the receiving of God's spirit. Amen. You know, some years ago, I was, uh, or actually not even, not even that long ago, it was the end of 2019, I was preaching an evangelistic series in the U.S., in the States, and um, as uh, I was preaching from night to night about these incredible prophecies and the gospel, I remember very well that um, there was a young couple that came to those meetings, and um, one evening I got to talk with them, and they told me, they told me their story. They said, you know, uh, we were just on a downward spiral in life, and we had been taking drugs, and uh, eventually we just lost, lost everything, and um, and now we were just living in our car. 
and we were living in our car and we were sleeping in our car on a car on a parking lot and um and then one uh, one evening there's this woman that comes up to our car and she was in her early 80s and she says to us like uh, I, I i don't want I, i've seen you here a few days and and, and I, I don't want you to you know to, to live in your car like i have a spare room in my house please join me come to my house and so they they came to the house of this this adventist lady she was in her early 80s and um they spent some time with her in her home. And then as we started this, this evangelistic series, this lady invited this couple that was now staying in her home to come to the evangelistic meetings. And as I heard that, I thought to myself, what a powerful example of loving till the end, loving till the end. I mean, this lady, you could, what, if you're in your early eighties, you can think of like, okay, I've, I've done my duty, you know, retirement time. I'm just going to enjoy life. The last scene, the sunset of my, my life. I'm just going to enjoy it for myself. I'm going to go on holidays. And then this lady, and she was known for, for, for her, for loving people till the end. Here she is in her early, early eighties. And she takes in this couple, brings them to the evangelistic meeting. And then as the appeal was made, both of them decided to get baptized. My friends, what, what, a, what a witness, what can happen when we start loving till the end, when we start enduring till the end? There are souls out there that need to hear the gospel. There are souls out there that need to see the gospel. And may you and I be among that generation that will reveal that kind of love. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, I wanna thank you for having been with us through this Bible study. I wanna thank you for your Holy Spirit. I wanna thank you for the amazing promise in your word that one day soon, that rain, the latter rain will fall. Lord, we long for it. We long for those days. But in the meantime, as we wait, help us to endure. Help us to reveal that love day to day that you revealed to your disciples. Help us, Lord, to be filled with your spirit, to go forth in your name, and to see people one for your kingdom. I want to pray for every single person listening right now, but I also want to especially pray for the Peace alumni. Lord, you have called them for a specific task, Lord. And I pray that you may reveal to them what that is and how they can be best used in your work. Thank you for the work that is going forward in England. And I pray that you will help um, the, the, the churches and, and the lay ministries and, and peace training program and everything that's happening. May it, may, it, may, it sync, may it be all synced together, Lord, for the building up of your kingdom. And we want to just lay ourselves in your hands today, thanking you and praying in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Pastor Daniel Pell, thank you very much for that powerful message. Um, the one thing that, well, there's many things that stood out for me, but I love the, the linking of love with enduring mm -hmm. and loving to the end. Um, so I'm just really grateful for the message. I pray, I believe, I know by God's grace, it's going to encourage everybody who's with us right now, the alumni and everybody who's watching online, um, because that's what we need to do. We need to love to the end. Um, so thank you again for the message. For those of you that are watching online with us right now, and for the alumni that are with us in Zoom or maybe watching online, um, I just want to encourage you all stay with us um, just for a little bit as we go offline. Um, but I do want to remind you that we have our program starting at 5 p.m. Um, and it will continue through till 9 p.m. So from 5 to 7, we're going to hear some testimonies, some experiences. We're going to watch a, a powerful video some videos um, of the history of where peace, some of the peace students were and where they are now and what's going on with um, many of us. Uh, the interesting thing is, you know, still look the same. As I looked at one of the videos, I was like, they still look the same. Um, but I believe that the experiences that you have are filled with, with so much. Um, so I'm looking forward to hearing some of the stories and some of the ministries that are starting up as well from the work that's being done. Um, I'd also like to, if you do want to watch online for that, I have shared, if you want to join us in those Zoom meetings, I have shared that in the Facebook and the YouTube comments right now. And I'd just like to share what we'll be doing tomorrow regarding training. We believe that where we are right now, especially in 2021, 
with the pandemic and everything, um, while we have been online a lot, a lot of YouTube programs, a lot of Zoom programs, what we have seen is that this is an opportunity where resources are constantly being created. Um, before 2020, there were probably just a few ministries that you'd go to when you wanted to speak or get some insight on some topics. But now resources have been created every time that a sermon's been preached and it's saved on YouTube. Tomorrow, what we want to do is have some programs, a training session that will be running from 10.45 till about 6, 10 past 6 in the evening. And we've just got a number of people who will be training on some platforms that are very relevant for use right now. So I'm just going to share, see if I can share some of those pictures. Okay, hopefully you can all see this. Tomorrow at, what do we have? Tomorrow at 11 a.m. until 12 p.m., we've got Naomi teaching us on how to use TikTok. Um, from 12.15 through to 1.15, we've got Eden showing how to do a live stream right now as you're watching um, we're on Zoom, but I'm also live streaming this program to Facebook and YouTube. And Eden's just going to give us some basic principles showing how we do this and how live streaming can be done. Then at 1.30 till 2.30, we will be looking at how to create a blog by Dougie. And then at 2.45 to 3.45, we've got how to create a podcast with Ethan. Um, Dougie runs a ministry which is called Insight Blog and Ethan runs a ministry which is called Deep and um, they're both actually running a program on Sundays right now on how to do Bible studies and I love the way that they've put the two names of the ministry together and it's called Deep Insight. Powerful. Um, Ethan will be showing you how to do a podcast at 2.45 to 3.45 and then at um, 4 to 5 p.m. we've got how to create content for social media so even the image, the poster that you're looking at, we'll be looking at how we go about creating that. And that will be done by Natalie, Denise, and Douglas from the Common Room team. And then at five past, five past 10, at 10 past five until 10 past six, we'll be having Jonathan, who will be teaching us how to create YouTube videos. So that's going to be taking place. Please do make note of the Zoom ID um, and the passcode so that you can join. Um, now, if you don't want to come for all of them, you don't have to, but there may be some that's relevant for you. You'd like some training on some of them. Do come to those. Um, we're looking forward to seeing you either later on for where we come for a bit of fellowship and coming together. And we also look forward um, to seeing you tomorrow. A question is just being asked me, will this be on YouTube? Yes, we will be making it available on YouTube. So you will be able to get access to that. Um, and we'll let you know when that will be made available for you. Again, I want to say thank you to everyone. We hope you have a fantastic Sabbath. I know that we are at this moment. Um, it's quarter past one. Some of you might be thinking I need to go and warm up my food if it's not already warmed up. But Daniel, again, we want to thank you. And I just want to encourage you, while your bellies might be rumbling, endure to the end and just wait and be patient. Um, so I'm just going to say a word of prayer, then I'm going to take the live stream off. Let's just pray. Dear Lord, thank you for your loving kindness. Thank you for this powerful message that you've shared through Pastor Daniel today. Lord, I pray that we will have your love revealed in us. For when we do have that love that will endure to the end, a witness will be given to the nations as it's been mentioned. A revelation of your character that in the midst of enemies and friends, we, we seek to reach them by appealing to the heart. Hearts that are often cold and in need of remedy can only be helped and healed with your love. Nothing of ourselves, but everything of you. So Lord, help us as we do endure to the end with your strength and in your power. In Jesus' precious name we say, amen. God bless you all and see you soon. All right, so...